So a quick 15 minute cover of the BIM integration update and then that's us done. We've got feature pack one coming out on Friday as you know. There are some new tools in there which will um, ease <laughs> the process of importing models from Revit, from um, MicroStation or for, from wherever they might be. Um, what I did think it was worth doing, I am going to talk about that, what, what's actually in FB1, <clears throat> but I just thought it's worth, again, reiterating the basic principles, which haven't changed since we started trying to do this a number of years ago, a long time ago. Um, these are all written down, they're in the white paper, there's a, a, a link to a YouTube session, a faculty session that we did two years ago now. Uh, which explains all the principles given sort of model examples the way Michael did with the Part L stuff, which we've had quite good feedback on. We are about to update the white paper as well, but a lot of the principles, as I say, they haven't changed and they won't be changing. And they're outlined there. Um, so keeping the geometry simple, now I do appreciate that you rarely have control over the quality of the models that you get. So somebody says, here's a model, go away and do your Part L compliance check on it. And it's never as simple as that. Um, but I just think it's worth reiterating these principles again, because at least if you know what's required, you can sort of feed that push back a bit and say, well, if you do this, this and this, it's going to make it feasible for, for us to get this model in relatively simply. So keeping it simple, cutting out any elements within the building, um, that you don't need. I mean, effectively, all we need is the walls, windows, floors, doors, roof. Um, so things like balustrades, doorknobs, light switches, all that stuff. <laughs> you know, if you can get a model with all that kind of detail stripped out of it, your life is going to be a lot easier. Um, detached from central, purge what's not required. So if you have cleaned out or if someone's cleaned out for you the model, um, you can just remove those elements that have been taken out. So that the idea here is that then you end up with two separate models. You know, so you've got a stripped down version of it and you've got the fully detailed model that the architects, I guess, are working on. Um, using appropriate family types. So if you are building a wall, use a wall type, a wall family. Um, if you are putting in a roof or a ceiling or whatever, use the appropriate families because then the VE will recognise those for what they are. Now we don't, I mean that, it doesn't happen like that, I do appreciate that, but I'm just trying to sort of explain to you what is required to make it easier. Um, use, use the lowest uh, complexity setting, so within Revit, if, you're do, if you are actually setting up the export, you can, you've got five different levels of complexity to choose from. Really always use the simple geometry one if you can. Um, and it, it just reduces, greatly reduces the number of surfaces that the model is then trying to process. Okay, so basically when you come across from Revit, for example, the virtual environment is trying to read every single surface in that model, and that is where it falls down, you know, um, or it takes a long time to actually do that. Um, so unless you need the mullions and everything in there in detail for doing a, a detailed radiance analysis, then it is very unlikely that you need to use the most complex level of detail for export. Once you're in the virtual environment, run a model check. And one of the new features now in FP1 is a more detailed report on the errors within that geometry. Okay, so the areas that you've got to sort out. And you set the model to be, to be at the origin, basically. Um, so this, again, this is just reiterating stuff that's already in the, the white paper. So make sure your area and volume computation are switched on. Make sure in section that your levels are shown correctly. Um, so you can see there on the screen that the, the rooms or zones in that model are all sort of shaded in blue. And you control that using this visibility graphics um, dialog box, okay? So you don't want to see this is the issue with the ceiling voids as well. Whether you want to have the ceiling voids, if they're created in Revit or they're in your GBXML model separately from the room zone, um, do you want to just take the level right up and have that as one thermal zone? Or do you want to have those ceiling voids modelled as a separate entity within the VE because they are an active um, you know, 
part of your design strategy, like for example. Um, so that's where you would choose if you create if if you just sort of change the levels to be the, the slab, then it's going to take that as one whole thermal zone and ignore the ceiling voids. It's sorry, any kind of ceiling tile, ceiling finish in there. And most of the time, that would be, I would suggest that would be the way to go. Unless you specifically need the ceiling voids for analysis. Um, that was the settings, the complexity that I was talking about. So um, with GBXML, this is not Revit, but GBXML export, you've got these five levels of complexity. Use the simple one mostly, or simple with shading surfaces. And that it does dramatically reduce the number of surfaces that this software is trying to deal with. Okay. Um, there are various conditions, um, like you can see here, this little bit of partition that's sort of jutting into the, the space that we're interested in. We would ignore that. So we would set that little bit of, of wall there to be non-room bounding. So the software effectively ignores it. Um, the same with uh, cells. So a lot of the time when you bring geometry in, you will see um, like double layers of wall effectively. And a lot of the time that's created by having a cell which comes out. So the software is taking that as the, the, le the sort of internal um, face of your wall, which is actually the cell surface. And then beyond that, it's got the, the line of the, the window, if you like. So you've got two layers there one of which is completely redundant, obviously, um, and won't have the correct constructions assigned to it or anything like that. So again, if you make, if you can set well cells to be non-room bounding, um, room separa separation lines, layers of construction, so if you've got a, a wall that's already made up with bricks and insulation block, etc., that will come in as multiple layers. It won't be correct for the purposes of your analysis. Um, so it's just simple things like that. <coughs> ceiling, as I said, ceiling, ceiling plenums and voids only bring them over as modelled separately if the analysis requires them, okay? Or you can model them in the VE separately. So it's always a balancing up the, the your time versus the requirement for, for the geometry that you're bringing across. Do you need it all? Okay, so the import enhancement in FP1 is found within Tools, Preferences and um, Shell Import tab, okay? Um, and what this is doing is giving you a lot more control over how you view the model. You've got a lot more settings in there. Um, one of the things that we're still kind of wrangling with, as far as I can understand, is columns. You can, in previous, well, up until now, you would have to set columns to be non-room bounding so that you avoid this situation where you've got a column in the middle of a virtual environment space which is causing all sorts of problems, tessellation in the roof and floor, uh, sorry, the ceiling and floor surfaces, etc. So up until now you would have to set the columns to be non-room bounding. Now you can just choose to ignore them altogether. So just, you know, forget them. And as long as they've been modelled correctly as columns or set, set up properly using the appropriate family type, then that will be fine. What we're still trying to work our way around is where they have been set up as rooms or something like that in uh, the GBXML tool. Um, so how do we tell our software to ignore that? Um, which does happen. Um, and I mean that, you know, it doesn't sound like a, a massive achievement or a massive step forward, but the columns are one of the things that really, really causes problems because obviously in a lot of cases they are, you know, they're faceted when they come in. So a single column might be six or eight or ten different surfaces. Across the whole building that's hundreds and thousands of additional surfaces that, that you know, we really don't need for the purposes of what we want to do. So just making these um, gradual improvements every time we release a feature pack or a new version uh, is how we're going forward. Um, so there's other things which are in there. So the tidy um, function has been upgraded quite a bit. So it's doing a lot more filling of gaps in geometry that comes over. So even with mismatched surfaces, where you've got a sort of a, a curved roof meeting a wall and there's gaps in there, it will fill those things in. 
but you again the user has a lot more control over how it does that and, and what it actually tidies and fills. Um, space boundaries from columns, as I say, you can just tell it to ignore them altogether. A minimum space boundary area, so for very small rooms uh, within the model, um, it might be like cupboards and things like that. You don't really need to bring, you know, there might be a separation boundary around that cupboard and it's set up as a separate room or zone or entity. You can just tell it to ignore anything below a certain uh, surface area. And the same for um, the maximum space boundary count. So if it's, um, you know, if it's finding, like, as I said, with the columns creating tessellated surfaces. So if you have a column going there, it's got all these, like, you know, 20 or 30 shapes making up that sort of broken ceiling now. Um, you can tell it to, when it gets to above a certain level, just assume that it's, you know, a single surface. So it's all about um, simplifying that so that the virtual environment can make sense of those surfaces and their relationships to one another for the purposes of analysis. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but basically, I guess in simple terms, the, the tidy algorithms have been greatly improved. So the gap filling and the fault tolerance is almost 100%. So that's a, a good thing and a bad thing in a way. It means that any, any GBXML model that you try to import well, is very likely to come through now. Okay, so you can just import anything. Um, and what we will do is we kind of advise the user, okay, these are all the errors with this geometry. You choose to fix them or not. You run the simulation, you know, you get what you get. So. Uh, we were constraining things, I think, trying to control the quality of the, the geometry that we were bringing in to run the simulations on, which, which resulted in people having quite a low success rate in getting any geometry in. So now we've loosened, we've sort of, t you know, we've taken those constraints off quite a bit. Um, and it means that you can get the geometry in, but you will still obviously be responsible for, for the quality of the geometry that you run the simulations on. So there'll still be work required, I guess. Um, and then the new report, as I say, that's, that's out as well. So it's a lot more detailed. I think there's an example. Yeah, it's far too small to read. But there is a, an example of the report there. So it gives you a, a summary of all the raw space boundaries in the file and the process space boundaries in the file. So that's the success rate of the rooms coming across. We're getting about, I think it's between 94, I think it's either 94 or 97% success rate out of, you know, over a thousand models that we've, we've tested. So, yeah, it's looking good. But what I would like to do is to, again, invite feedback on this. We haven't really tested this um, with customers yet. We've tested it internally, mainly because whenever we've tried to sort of set up a, a beta testing program for this in the past, it hasn't happened um, so we're just going to make it available and we will see what feedback we get from people. Okay? And if anybody's particularly interested in engaging with us in a, in a more formalised way in doing that, then we would welcome that.